Yeah, I think there, there couldn't really be a more interesting time to discuss the German Revolution and the consequences for the revolutionary upheavals that Europe witnessed in the, in the 19, 1920s, because more than anything, the events that, uh, that, uh, that the socialist movement and the revolutionary movement went through in Germany kind of uh, have contained some very important lessons that we can discuss today. The second, uh, the second reason why it's so important to discuss the German Revolution at this moment in time is that actually a number of people on the revolutionary left at this moment in time are rediscovering some of the writings by the KPD leader Paul Levy. Our tran David Fernbach has recently translated many of his works which have been unavailable in, into, into the English language. Uh, Gareth Jenkins, our very own comrade, is currently translating Pierre Brouet's uh, writings on the com common term from French into English. And there's, and, there's going to be, uh, and there's going to be a lot of other debates that are going to be happening over the next couple of years in relation to the, uh, to the, ger to the lost German revolution. The third one, and the most important one really for us as revolutionary socialists and activists trying to shape the world that we currently live in, is to answer the question that is most pertinent today is, you have millions of people who are asking what's the alternative to capitalism and are you know, engaging in different movements, are involved in different struggles against the, against the system or, against, or, or partial aspects of, of the system, yet you have a very small revolution, revolutionary uh, minority. And I think those three are really the starting point for, uh, for the discussion that people should bear in mind whilst we're, whilst we're go, going through the meeting. And we'd just like to start off with a kind of a, a, a chronology of the, of the German Revolution, because the German Revolution took place between 1918 and, 19, and 1923. But the actually, you can't understand the German Revolution and the lost German Revolution without understanding the impact of 1914 and the First World War. And the fact that in 1914, the SPD, which counted up to a million members, polled in 1912, polled four million votes, in, in the elections, suddenly was, you know, which was even by Lenin deemed as one of the most important Marxist organizations, and until 1914, Lenin still believed that Kautsky, the godfather of German Marxism, was really the greatest le Marxist leader. Suddenly they said yes to granting the war credits for Germany and Kaiser Wilhelm to, into going into, into World War, in, into world, uh, world War I. That had massive disastrous consequences, not only for <coughs> the German S, uh, so, uh, SPD and social democracy in Germany, but it had consequences and reverberations across uh, across the uh, across the world socialist world socialist movement. The the SPD didn't collapse. The SPD stayed at similar at similar heights. However, what did happen is is that the second international the second international, uh, second international collapse. What was the SPD? What was the SPD like? The SPD, I think, really had four had, until 19, 1908, Really, was could be summed up by having uh, four wings. The first wing was the kind of Bernstein, uh, the kind of Bernsteins who vehemently argued, you know, for gradual reform in order to take, in order to kind of, you know get the, the dictatorship of the proletariat by electoral means. The second, uh, the second strand of people are the kind of people around Karl Kautsky, who actually take a very, a very similar line in terms of their political practice inside of the SPD. So they focus on building the, uh, building the SPD as you know, working class clubs with you know, football clubs, choirs, you know, trade associations, crafts associations in every town and every city across, across Germany. And his vision was that in some ways a vision of socialism from above, that the SPD would deliver socialism to, uh, to, the, to, the, mass, uh, to the masses. In Kautsky's writings himself, what you, kind of, what you really see is the kind of worst deterministic aspects of Marxism, pure, uh, pure economism as, as such, with no room for, hu for human agency. Then there were, uh, was the group uh, which wasn't even formally organized around Rosa Luxemburg and what later became the Spartacus, uh, the Spartacus Bund. And one of the things was really is that 
They never took any kind of formal positions inside of, uh, inside of the bureaucracy of the SPD. They had no base whatsoever. And most of them, except with one exception of Karl Liebknecht, effectively just you know, taught at the Sunday schools or taught in the uh, workers' universities. Of, 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 the, of the SPD. The fourth strand, which is often not that well defined, is actually played quite an important role in the, in the early years of the SPD and then was uh, expelled from the SPD in 1908, which were the localists, which had kind of a syndicalist version of trying to navigate against the kind of parliamentarianism of the SPD and just constant and the kind of perversion of the primacy of politics uh, that, Kautsky, that Kautsky was putting forward and effectively concentrated on building, on building mass strikes. And as many of you will know, in 1905, with the advent of the Russian, with the defeat of the Russian Revolution, uh, Rosa Luxemburg engages in a polemic around the mass strike in which she talks about the self-activity of the workers and how spontaneous workers' uprisings could start to break through the kind of centralism of organizations and, and the kind of contortions that the SPD uh, was subject to. And in that way, the localists then were kicked out, out uh, of the SPD in 1908. And they will play a role later on. Uh, later on. And I need, to move, I need to move on, otherwise we won't get through all of the various different things. But I think that's important, that's important to bear in mind. What happens is 1914, uh, the SPD votes for war. What happens is, is that Rosa Luxemburg finds herself in an apartment uh, sending telegrams to more than 300 socialists uh, and people that she had thought were revolutionaries. And most of them didn't even respond, respond back. The most famous of them, Clara Tsetkin, effectively you know, joins, joins the kind of, you know, the loose group of, of people, including Franz Mehring, who was uh, Mar Karl Marx's biographer, including uh, Leo Jogesis, who was uh, uh, Rosa Luxemburg's lover, and a, number, and, a, and a number of other people. And until that day, they had never engaged or had never built up some, any kind of formal organization inside of the SPD. And that throughout the time, of the revolutionary year starting 1918 would consistently come back to haunt them. It consistently would become a sticking point for Rosa Luxemburg, not only in her theory, but also in her political practice, that for years she believed that spontaneous workers' uprisings could smash through the bureaucracy. But what she didn't do in, inside of the SPD at that, uh, in the years running up to 1914 is ever try to combat the kind of bureaucratism, the kind of centralism of the SPD by forming an informal or loose group or some kind of way of actually starting to put the self-activity of workers at the heart of the SPD, of putting the strikes that we saw from 1916 onwards in, by the Berlin engineers, of trying to actually link it up inside of the political practice of the SPD itself. And so the Spartacus uh, League, or the Spartacus Bund, no relation to the wackos you see selling you know, copies of the North Korean paper, um, effecti effectively had counted a few hundred members. And on the first demonstration that they called, in nine, uh, they, that they, called they actually gained an initiative that, could, you know, that uh, gathered more than 10,000 people. But nevertheless, they were a small group, an isolated group. Now, it isn't simply good enough to kind of accuse Rosa Luxemburg of saying, why didn't she break with the SPD much earlier? Because that's often an argument you encounter. Why did she stay in such a reformist organization? And what Rosa Luxemburg saw, said, and what also Lenin, ha Lenin had believed until 1914, that the SPD was a revolutionary organization of some sort or another, and looked to Karl Kautsky uh, and, and looked to the leaders of the SPD. And Rosa Luxemburg was convinced of the fact that revolutionary socialists had to be there and work amongst where, work wherever the masses were uh, were to be uh, were to be uh, were to be found. What she said was, uh, "We cannot be outside the organization, out of contact with the masses. The worst of workers' party is better than nothing." And that's what she said after some of her best friends, who were some of the localists and syndicalists were ex being expelled from, from, the organ from the organization. And that's what's really stuck with her and her politics 
throughout the and throughout her entire her entire life. What happens is very quickly the situation changes. In 1917, you see the February Revolution take center center stage, and what Rosa Luxemburg sees is not the end of the effort of create of revolution, but the beginning. That the 1917 February Revolution opened up the possibility for socialist transformation, for revolutionary upheavals, and for a, so a socialist world to become a real. As a, a real possibility, not only in Russia but also uh, in the rest in the rest of Europe and and around uh, and around the world. And and ten minutes, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> what happens then in Germany is is you like everywhere else, like in Mark Thomas's talk, you heard about Gramsci and the Italian Revolution of how you know the factories were being occupied. In Germany, you see something very similar. In Kiel, one of the northern cities, the war has ended. Kaiser Wilhelm decides, nevertheless, to send out as the most, some of the most militant sailors out onto sea to launch another attack. The sailors decide to effectively not take, not take orders any longer and, mute, and, mute, and, and a mutiny, and they create a mutiny. Then they set up a soldiers and workers council, and in a matter of days, those soldiers and workers council spread throughout the entirety of Germany. That forces Kaiser Wilhelm II to step down, and Friedrich Ebert uh, of the SPD, the very right wing, the very, very right wing, but nevertheless reformist at that time, leader of the SPD, is able and is catapulted and is catapulted in, into, into power. In 1918, we see those workers and soldier councils literally everywhere, from Bavaria up onto into the Ruhr area, into Berlin, and everywhere possible, you see, uh, you see the workers and soldier, soldier councils. And so at that point, the Spartacus, uh, the Spartacus League is organized inside of the USPD, the Independent Socialist, uh, Social, uh, Social Democrats, which effectively have not really grappled with the fact of what their role inside of those struggles is. Is it in order to generalize, coordinate between the workers' struggles? Is it simply to try to widen the scope of the workers' and soldier councils? Because unlike in Russia, where the Soviets played a role of organizing social, social life, where they broke out of the confines, uh, the narrow confines of the workplaces. Effectively, in Germany, they, uh, in most cases, they were stuck. Uh, they were stuck inside of uh, inside of those co in, inside of those confines. Or what was their role? Or was their role to put pressure onto the SPD for another section of left-wing activists to break uh, to break away? And that never really was clarified. However, what happens is that those you know hundreds, a few hundreds, that had grown to a, a few couple of thousand. As, as the war and as the crisis deepens inside of Germany, suddenly are plunged into a situation where the ruling class could no longer rule in the same way anymore, and, and workers will no, were no longer accepting the rule anymore. More. And what it heads to is that the November Revolution, one of the first staging posts, effectively means that effectively comes to a, uh, effectively comes to a massive confrontation of mass workers' demonstrations in Berlin and in large parts of the country, and then following on from that to, to an insurrectionary movement, which because the, because the revolutionaries who were organized were a minority inside of that movement, and the SPD, even though it was reformist, even though it was a rotten party, even though it couldn't re didn't even relate to what workers were, were, doing on the, uh, were doing on the ground, nevertheless, workers all looked to the SPD for some kind of solution of stability. And that is a crucial question of how there were missed opportunities in creating a network of revolutionary socialists that when the time was right, effectively could coordinate, could start to fight, build a, 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 a combat organization that could lead a successful assault on the capitalist <coughs> state. That wasn't possible at that moment in time. And so what you had was, was people like Friedrich Ebert playing actually a dual role between reform and even counter-revolution. That it wasn't simply the case that Friedrich Ebert was on the one hand, you know, uh, sending, uh, sending, uh, sending the Fry Corps onto uh, who was like a paramilitary organization of the state, 
onto the workers and smashing them up all at once. He also was playing the role of consistently trying to win worker support in order to, in order to continue with the plan, in order to get the state to run in its normal, in its normal lines instead, instead, of, um, instead of effectively having a socialist revolution at, at his hands. What happens is, is that effectively two of the most prominent figures of the revolutionary left in the insurrection are killed. Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht are, uh, are, are, are murdered in January, on the 15th of January, 1919. And what you have is, is that this happens in a situation where effectively you have, would have had to have the people, the socialist agitators, the kind of, pe uh, the kind of cater of Lenin and Trotsky in order to effectively build a success, uh, uh, conduct a successful socialist revolution in Germany. So uh, Germany finds itself in civil, in civil war, and what happens is, is that the right wing very quickly, after the, after the defeat of the November Revolution, uh, suddenly finds itself with the cup putsch. And what happens with the cup putsch is that workers actually succeed in beating back the cup putsch. And what you can clearly see is, is the kind of dynamic that runs through revolutions, that it isn't simply an approximation or some kind of gradual step until workers, until workers finally can see state power, but that there are retreats, there are, there are advances by the revolutionary forces. But what happens is, is that the cut push, even though it was successful as a defensive strategy in order to beat back the right-wing forces, the kind of defeat of the November Revolution of 1918 lays, laid very heavily upon the militant upon the militant activists. The section of people that was least affected by that defeat and the people who underestimated the defeat of the November Revolution effectively were the young activists who had been drawn into revolutionary activity during, during those years. And what it meant was is that you had suddenly you had a situation in which all around the world communist parties are forming and in Germany where you have the most advanced industrial state where Lenin says the, the, the success of the Russian revolution depends on whether the revolution is able to advance in Germany doesn't even have a communist party and you're thinking all these years that in, in Russia you had to go through 1905, you had a cater that was able to work together, that had developed a common analysis, a common perspective, had, you know, had to fight their faction fights against the Mensheviks, that had to fight you know, against the anarchists, against all the socialist revolutionaries, against all these different factions. You suddenly didn't have an organization which was capable of kind of coming together, drawing out a common perspective, drawing out a common analysis of what the balance of class forces is in Germany, of where the revolutionary is, of what the defeat of the November Revolution means, etc. And effectively, you start to you start to have you start to have problem. What comes along is it couldn't get any worse. Zinoviev comes with Bela Kuhn, come over to Germany and Radek as well and this is very fast forward, and say that effectively <laughs> you need to form a communist party. Zinoviev gives a four-hour speech in German at the USPD Congress. The right wing leaves the, leaves the Congress of the USPD, and the USPD decides the 400,000 members of the USPD join, join, the, very small, uh, join the very small communi uh, communist party that had been, that had been established. And what the Communist Party of Germany's formation in, in 19, yeah, 19, uh, 1919 really is, is you get three strands you get together. I'll have to speak, uh, have to speak longer. I'll need to at least seven more minutes. He's <laughs> <laughs> already had five more. What? You already had five more. Well, what right. you get All is right, okay. you, you get the kind of youth that didn't under that didn't understand the that didn't understand the defeat of nineteen of nineteen eighteen come. You had the old you had the cater of the Spartacus Bund, and what you had were the kind of centrists. Because you had revolu the revolutionary shop stewards movement, particularly the Berlin engineers around Richard Müller, who were absolutely revolutionary in their essence. But because all the youth were, and all the unemployed workers and whatnot were, you know, kind of had this short-termist, 
revolutionary spirit and you know we're totally romantic about how you know the world would you know develop and revolutionary just was around the corner so we had to accelerate every, uh, so that uh, workers would have to just accelerate what it meant was is that the serious working class militants like Richard Müller didn't even didn't even attend the communist for a founding congress of the communist party and that consistently meant that there was a disconnect between the new and uh, newly established communist party which was so desperately required at that moment in time and the mass and the mass of workers and what Bru Bruet explains was the Spartacist leaders were isolated from these militant organizers of the working class the genuinely indispensable cater of a workers revolutionary party as they were doubtless aware they had no foothold in the industrial workers movement on the other hand the admirable fighters in the berlin factories were deprived of political leadership <laughs> the newborn communist party was from the start isolated from the masses and it was doomed to impotence before it had swung into action and what that means is that because they didn't have the kind of revolutionary leaders that were required at that moment in time zinoviev who was moved and bukharin who were in control of the ECCI, which was the wing uh, of, the, of the Comintern, effectively, and this is where all the nice debate starts that have started over the recent, recent months, effectively give kind of tacit permission for the, uh, in 1921 for the Communist Party to effectively launch what they called the March Action. And it was totally based on what is called the theory of offensive, which means that a small revolutionary minority could take action on behalf of the vast majority of workers and move the sleeping masses into action. What that meant in practice was is that the Communist Party, in a matter of two weeks, robbed almost all banks in Berlin, blew up all railway bridges in the, across the country, and that isn't great, <laughs> and, effective, and effectively, what it also, what it also led to was that they believed that they could wake the sleeping masses, the workers, the vast majority of workers, not by winning and convincing them of arguments, but effectively by producing action, uh, by a substitution, by substitutionism and developing action on their own behalf. And that had disastrous consequences. The March action, the March action was was absolutely smashed. And by smashed, there's no comparison to what it really, what it really meant. 10,000 communist militants lost their jobs, who were organized in the Communist Party. 6,000 were imprisoned, and 400 were murdered by, by, the, by the German state. And that effectively led to a massive break in the, inside, inside of the Communist Party. The Communist Party lost half, a, half of its membership that it had acquired between 19... 1998, 1919 and 1920 when Paul Levy was the leader of the Communist Party and had started to reach out to the kind of centrists, to the workers who had, you know, been holding reformist ideas with open letters which could fight around, you know, limited, de limited demands and it could start and could start to bridge the gap between revolution, a small revolutionary minority and the revolutionary masses. What happens in 1921 after the March action is that Paul Levy, wrongly so, writes, uh, writes a pamphlet which absolutely slates the Communist Party and absolutely takes no responsibility for what, ha what happens. And, 19 and, and what happens then is, is that Paul Levy is expelled from the Communist Party even though he had been the leading, leading figure of the Communist Party. And you get the kind of ultra-leftists who had, you know, who had dominated the party, really taking over. And Brundler, by no stretch of imagination, Heinrich Brundler was by no stretch of imagination a Lenin. And so when it came to, so when it came to 1923, when the French troops occupied the Ruhr area, what you saw was is that workers again were starting to rise up, form workers' councils in cities across in cities across Germany. And then what it meant was that Brundtler had no way, and the German leadership had no way of kind of galvanizing or coordinating between different, you know, workers' councils. It didn't have any experience of how to conduct the struggle, because effectively what had happened was, is that Paul Levy, like Rosa Luxemburg, like Karl Liebknecht, actually, compared to Lenin, compared to Trotsky, were, you know, dwarfs amongst giants. But what actually Brundtler was, was an ant being directed by, 
by the, by the Communist Party. What does Brandler decide to do? He goes over to Russia and effectively asks Trotsky to lead an insurrection in Germany. And the problem with that was is that Zinoviev says, no, Trotsky can't lead an insurrection in Germany. Make a short story, short story, uh, make a short story even shorter. <laughs> effectively, what you end up with is that the call for an insurrection to coincide with the anniversary of the Bolshevik insurrection, and it is postponed from one day to another without even workers in Hamburg knowing about it. They go into the offensive in Hamburg and effectively are, are, are smashed. And what it means is that capitalism succeeds in restoring itself inside, inside, of, inside of Germany. Now, I didn't speak a lot about Rosa Luxemburg. Actually, it should be like an hour meeting or whatever, but I don't have that much time. But what I think the three key lessons are that we need to learn ta and take away from the, from the lost German revolution. The first and foremost one is that even in non-revolutionary times, we need to build a revolutionary organization. And that is more in that, and, we can, and the, what the lesson is, is, and through all these kind of anecdotes, is that you can't build one from scratch at the, at the high point of revolutionary, uh, of the revolutionary upheaval. That a cater must be molded in the kind of battles that take place in non-revolutionary times. That the kind of ideas, that the ideological clarity is a product of long years of internal struggles, of external struggles, and effectively of battles, of battles, to, be, uh, battles to, be, uh, to be waged. And Paul Levy said in 1919 already, there's not a single communist in Germany today who does, the, who does not regret that the foundation of a communist party did not take place long ago before the war. The second lesson I think that we really take away, and it has come a bit short, is that even in, at the height of revolutionary upheavals, when workers are organizing themselves into workers and soldier councils, when they're organizing in Tahrir Square or wherever it may be in the future, that even then, reformist and centrist ideas nevertheless continue to prevail amongst workers. That even then, there's no safeguard that, that workers automatically become revolutionary. And I think that's one of the key lessons that really we need to take away for, uh, from the meeting. That even then, it's particular then, uh, at that particular moment, revolutionaries need to be organized. Because all the kind of re reified ideas, the way that Capitalism tries to restore itself, and as a flexible system, can try to you know can try to find a way out of the crisis. Means that there needs to be consistent work amongst amongst the num amongst the number of cater. And the bigger the cater is, effectively, and in, in Russia in February 1917 you had 25,000 members. In Germany at the height in 1918 you had 3,000 uh, 3,000 members inside of the communi communist party. Does make does make a difference. And I think the final thing is to say is Rosa Luxemburg, and I'll finish on this, had a number of criticisms of the Bolsheviks and the way the Bolsheviks, and I always had big arguments uh, with the Bolsheviks. And Lenin also had big arguments with Rosa Luxemburg. But ultimately, Rosa Luxemburg stands in the same tradition as Lenin, as Lenin and Trotsky. And the one thing is, and Lenin's word about Rosa Luxemburg really sums up, and I'll finish on this quote, uh, really sums up what the kind of problem and the limitations of the, not only of Rosa Luxemburg were, but also of the German Revolution. And he says, although the eagles do swoop down and beneath the chickens fly, chickens with outspread wings will never soar amid clouds in the sky. In other words, yeah, Rosa Luxemburg was an eagle amongst the chickens. And I think that's the lesson. Uh, that we need to take away from uh, we need to take away from this meeting today. In as much as the German Revolution was a re revolution that could have been led by eagles, but unfortunately was led by chickens. Um, I just have a quick question about Rosa Luxemburg right? and on the national question, because when this was brought up um, within our march, I think like a caricature of Rosa Luxemburg was created where, you know, they said that she completely reduced oppression um, to an issue of class and she completely rejects the idea of um, the political question around uh, nationalism and national liberation. So I think we can get that Questions, comments, nothing's too small, too big. Yeah, from what you've said, 
it appears to me that maybe reformism and ultra-leftism are more, are more connected than it seems. And that maybe ultra-leftism was the, was the reaction of years of working in a reformist way. Uh, would, would you agree that when Lenin is talking about ultra-leftism uh, in his book in 1920, he's basically criticizing the reformism of the SPD in the past years? Yeah, I think it's very useful to think of uh, reformism having a flip side of being ultra-leftism because it's really about the kind of model of how you achieve change. And so although for reformists they can bring change from above through parliament, it does seem very different from a kind of ultra-leftist, you know, setting up barricades and fighting the, the police on behalf of the workers. Ultimately the model about where that change comes from is a very elitist model of, uh, 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 of how change comes about. And I think I mean, a plank marked with me, and actually it's very rare times when you want to meet to go on much longer than, uh, than, than the bill time. I think it was very good. But, I mean, I think that's one of the interesting questions, isn't it, about how, how you relate to, to, to the reformist elements. And really one of the biggest challenges for the left in Britain has been dealing with the kind of the continuing uh, dominance of reformism in the different forms that, that it's had. I think Marx's right to stress the importance of, uh, of building a cadre, not you know, at some point in the future when there's an opportunity for us to do something, but the importance of building a cadre in the here and now. And I think events like this are very important for doing that. You know, I think you know, the, the, the building of a student cadre of the organisation isn't just about building the, the cadre of, uh, of people who will go out and sell the paper on their campus or will be the first at a demo to set up, but it's about seeing that actually the students in our organisation will go on into, into workplaces. They'll go on to be members of the organisation for, for a long time. I think it's very good to see a level of politics in this event, you know, seriousness amongst the student cadre, as that kind of engagement around the challenges uh, that the left is facing in Britain today. Um, and I think maybe, I mean, Mark touched very briefly on, uh, on it at the end, but the question of, for example, the disagreements that Rosa Luxemburg had around democratic centralism with Lenin. I think it's interesting to see that there are discussions like that that can come out, which didn't lead to neither of them cooperating, didn't lead to them saying, you know, neither of our, 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 our versions are compatible. And I think that's a very important strength in our tradition, is to look at the ways in which we can thrash out the kind of forms of organisation we need to, to take us forward and to raise a level of struggle, and not to be afraid that, you know, there is only, only one way we can have it. Yeah, um, the question around Paul Levi, I think, is a really interesting question at the moment. I mean, I think some of the key elements that we have to understand about Paul Levi, I mean, Mark really touched on it, is the question of the open letters and the question of the United Front. The question of how do you relate to a wider layer of people? How do you relate to the trade union bureaucrats that can pull in a wider layer of people? How do you relate to the Labour Party or the performance leaders that can pull in a wider layer of workers? And it's about working with them on single issue things, anti-fascism, and anti <coughs> when, when that comes into being. Uh, and being able to relate to that wider audience, but then also being able to push those campaigns forward so you can really get to the limitations of, of, of a reforming strategy and really win those people over to revolutionary politics. However, I, I do have a problem with Paul Levi, um, and I think that's around the question of the, the, the ultra-leftism, ultra essentially, because I think the problem with Paul Levi is he, he never really had the ability to win over the ultra-left politically, which I think is a key problem. Um, that's really echoed in the example where he expelled half his membership um, after the March action, really, I think. Whereas Lenin actually get, gets the grip to this, with this question a lot more, because Lenin understands that in revolutionary situations, in, in non-revolutionary situations, a part of this is because of the fact that he's built a Bolshevik party for the last 25 years, um, but he understands that ultra-leftism is going to be there. The anger, the passion, the willingness to fight against capitalism, that ultra-leftism is always going to be there within a revolutionary situation. And he actually understands also uh, that you can agree with the ultra leftists on some stuff. The people in Parliament, the people in trade unions are bureaucrats, they're scumbags. You don't really want to chat to them, but you have to understand you have to relate to the people that follow them, the workers that follow them. Uh, I, 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 I think then clearly that presents a question for us. If we really want to get to the grips with how we're going to relate to the workers that are following reformism in Britain in the, in the Labour Party, then we're really going to have to grapple with some of the questions around uh, 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 the Communist Party in, in, in Germany. 
because it's about really polemicizing with those people with the ultra-lefts, uh, but also really relating to the, the problems they have with the system, that we can actually win a wider level of people with left and right. Um, I mean, I think, I think that it, it's called the lost revolution because most people don't even know the, the history of the German revolution. I think it's immensely important because in many ways I think the German revolution will look much more like a revolution in a country like Britain. You think the Russian revolution is, you know, February to October famously because reformism is a weak current when trade union leaders are sent to Siberia. It's a much more serious current in Germany, just like it's a serious current. It's a revolution that lasts five years and many of them have it's very rich, and I think everyone should read Chris Harmon's book, The Lost Revolution, it's a fantastic book. I think that the, the, what's the theoretical reason why Luxembourg didn't build at least the embryo of a revolutionary party that can act collectively and independently before the revolution? And I think it's, I mean, Mark touched on that, I think it's the idea. Luxembourg essentially, and she of course understands her unevenness of consciousness inside the working class, but she thinks that mass, you know, mass strikes, mass struggles, revolution will tend to overcome that. And therefore, a revolutionary party is essentially about propaganda of socialist ideas, for which all we need really is a loose network. What's clear from the experience of the Russian Revolution, where it's the Mensheviks are hegemonic initially, the German Revolution, where it's the various versions of reformism that's hegemonic. We'll think about Egypt today, where in many ways the Muslim Brotherhood is best understood as a version of reformism, is hegemonic at the beginning of the revolution, is that even in mass struggles, reformist ideas persist because there's an unevenness of consciousness in workers that isn't simply overcome. You know, you can challenge the boss, but the idea that workers should run society is such a leap for the majority that it's not the instant common sense, right? Some version of change and radical and so on. And therefore, a revolutionary party that's an organized conscious minority that intervenes to clarify ideas, render class consciousness coherent, and act as a pole of attraction away from the reformists is very, very serious. Just on, I just wanted to make a point. I mean, 1921, March Action, it's true, they thought there was an insurrection opportunity there wasn't. In 1923, there was an insurrectionary opportunity, and the problem is, having built up relationships with the reformists, they failed to break from them. I, I thought you were too harsh on Brandler. Uh, I don't think he was an ad. I think he was a serious revolutionary who lacked confidence in himself. I mean, he built a mass base in Chemnitz, right? When others lost their head. I think the problem is that the, the leadership of the Communist Party, because they're trying to build a mass party in the midst of the revolution, kept on losing, they kept on making mistakes and had no inner confidence. So they said, come on, the Russians save us. You can't build a revolutionary party like that. You have to be independent and confident. Um, if you could come. There's a more question, but the second international, uh, especially the SPD, up up to the first world war, if it, if one was doing going to do a counterfactual, was it doomed to fail by the nature of its by the nature of its party, the fact that it, it, it had a huge base within within civil society and the various um, clubs, societies, um, uh, like local government and whatever, it is, was the party's model in itself. Not even if it had the Marxist program and theoreticians like like Kowski proclaiming Marxism, was it always doomed to to, to fail? Unlike um, was there was there a real real contingent difference between Lenin's um, Lenin's Bolshevik, Bolshevik party uh, in, in the period before 1914 than, um, than how the SPD operated? And can we explain the de degeneration of of the SPD with Iber and, and what have you in 1818 to 23 through the through the hegemony of the SPD within um, civil society in, in Germany before the war. Um, I think something Mark raised about um, really the need to build up a, a revolutionary organisation before the high points of struggle is quite an important thing at the moment. Um, and I thought it was coming out of another meeting and it was a question of in certain periods of time, so when there's no struggle, um, what's the balance between keeping the you know the revolutionary party at its basic you know operation to survive in a low in a low period of struggle and how there's that balance between essentially going beyond the basics and trying to expand out into you know, expand the audience, you know, expand the intervention among the working class. And I think that's, that's a, it's an interesting thing at, at, at this time, because essentially I think that the, the revolutionary organisers should constantly strive towards having a, 
a, pro a real intervention outside of the class. But for that to happen, sometimes you have to have arguments inside the organization to get a clarified position and to form a kind of solid basis of analysis. So therefore, you can, that flows through the organization has an impact for, on the work. But the question of CADA, I think, is very important. I think that the idea that you can kind of spontaneously form a, a, a CADA in certain high points of struggle is probably an idea doomed to fail um, unless, unless it's some kind of revolutionary organization of extreme um, education and ideological self-perfection to the maximum point, which is almost, almost impossible. So I think that question is important. I think there constantly needs to be uh, the, the process of caderization and the process of refining uh, you know, one revolutionary potential in the struggle, not just in theory, but those combined together, so that in the outcome there is a, an upturn in struggle, whether it's you know student movement, whether it's you know workers movement, whether it's international revolution. That at that point that happens, we have a we have the best possible chance of influencing that, and the best possible chances of shaping that and shaping the outcome. Okay. Okay, I think uh, I'll kick it off with uh, the SPD. I think that what really characterizes uh, the Marxism of the SPD, and particularly that of Karl Kautsky for me, is a certain determinism and lack of agency. And what you have on the other hand is, is really Rosa Luxemburg being the, flip, you know, being the flip side, being deterministic in the way that spontaneity can actually overcome kind of uh, the limitations. Uh, the limitations of organization. And I think that what is very interesting to observe is, is what Lenin actually did when the SPD voted for the war credits. Lenin went in 1914 and started to go back to Hegel and read Hegel's Science of Logic to try to rediscover the dialectic in Marxism that suddenly he saw as part, as part of the problem uh, of, why the, of why the SPD uh, of why the SPD voted, voted, for, uh, voted for the war credits. But I think there are some other aspects. I think one of the aspects is that unlike the Bolsheviks, whose cater tried to form a revolutionary class consciousness inside of the Russian working, working class, the SPD effectively furnished a reformist class consciousness and an accommodation with the system, uh, with the system that they, that they lived, lived under. And that isn't something that means that all the workers organized inside of the SPD were non-revolutionary, were not socialist or whatever, but effectively the, uh, the August Bebel, Karl Kautsky faction actually were the kind of cowards and the charlatans that you know, tried continuously tried to uh, put forward in their kind of theories in their, kind, in their kind of orientation and strategy since the Air Force Congress in 1892, the kind of policies that would continuously direct the SPD into the direction of reform rather than into the direction <coughs> of, of revolution. And I think that's a very important point. Bruet, in his, in his very good book uh, on, the, on the German Revolution, actually gives a bit of a materialist analysis of why the SPD uh, and the bureaucracy of the SPD continuously developed in that way. So he says the wing that was closest attached to the parliamentarianism, uh, parliamentarians, the wing that was closest associated with the trade union bureaucracy, continuously moved with after the anti-socialist laws, it effectively continues to move further to the right. What, me what happens is, is that at a rank and file level, Workers in their, you know, workers in their regional or in their local areas continue to produce their own papers, which had revolutionary messages. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg continues to teach at the open, at the univer at, the, at the university, continues to preach uh, revolution, and it's really that there are a number of un unresolved contradictions that remain inside of the organization. And I think it's what the ultimate contradiction, which means that Rosa Luxemburg, at the outbreak of the war, is left with such a small minority, even though she's one of the brilliant theoreticians and agitators of the time, is because not only didn't she build a formal network, she didn't even have an informal network of people around her that you know, she somehow tried, uh, tried uh, tried to, to, gal uh, to, to galvanize. I think that one of the important things really is, is that 
Paul Levy as one of the inheritors of Rosa Luxemburg's legacy after Rosa Luxemburg is murdered by the, uh, by the Free Corps, effectively tries to take up some of the notions that, uh, that Rosa Luxemburg and some of the key politics inside of the KPD that Rosa Luxemburg had tried to form at the beginning, at the founding congress of the KPD. And we need to understand, because she didn't even formalize a network or an informal network inside of the SPD, she lost most of the votes at the founding congress of the KPD against the ultra-leftists as well, which shows you that not only was she an outsider inside of the social, in, inside of the SPD, but she also was an outsider inside of the very, inside of the, commu inside of the Communist Party. And what Paul Levy tries to do is, Paul Levy tries to initiate a number of open letters which try to expose the kind of rhetoric of the SPD and the kind of rhetoric of the USPD in you know, advancing welfare and advancing uh, on question of houses, housing or taxation of the rich, and effectively calls on the trade union bureaucracy and on the SPD to join in action. And through that, he's able to transform this you know, wild <coughs> assemblage of kind of you know, ultra-leftists and you know, centrists who have broken away and are becoming revolutionaries into something in a matter of 12 months. He's able to form it in a party from 3,000 to 350,000, of course, in a revolutionary situation. But what happens subsequently is, is that effectively, you know, six months later, no longer is he the member, uh, leading member of the KPD, no longer is Clara Zetkin a, a, a leading member of the, K, of the KPD. And effectively, you have a situation in which the ultra-leftists he, he expelled, as Jonas said, weren't expelled after the March action. Actually, they were expelled, I think that was the second Congress of the Communist Party. Paul Levy expels them. They form an organization called the KAP. And the KAP takes its only task is to put pressure onto the KPD to spur them further into action. And so you don't have the only tension inside of the KPD, which is a tension between the kind of young activist the Spartacus Bund and the kind of shop stewards around Richard Müller, you also have an outside force of even crasser ultra-leftists continuously applying pressure, applying pressure from, uh, from, the out, from the outside. I think that in terms, in terms of uh, Rosa Luxemburg's differences with Lenin, what is really the, the best kind of summation of the differences is, is in Tony Cliff's book on Rosa Luxemburg from the, 19, from the 1950s. And there's basically four differences that she outlines. The first one is on the question of land redistribution and land distribution, and so the peasant question. The second one is on the question of, na of nationalities. The third one is on the question of uh, workers' democracy. Uh, workers' democracy, and the fourth one is on uh, is on organ on the question of of uh, party party and class or and the revolutionary organization, and that connects to Amna's point around the national question, because you need to imagine that Rosa Luxemburg wasn't actually even German; she was a foreigner inside of Germany, she came from from Poland, and had a long experience of Polish jingoism and nationalism. <coughs> which was really cruel and really vicious. And what she, unlike Lenin, who drew a distinction between the nationalism of the oppressed and imperial oppressor nations and the imperialist nations and the, and the nationalism of the oppressed nations, effectively Rosa Luxemburg, having grown up and having first started out in the Polish, Socialist, uh, uh, Pol Polish Social Democratic Party, effectively doesn't draw that distinction and brandishes and brands all nationalism uh, on an equal on an equal uh, equal foot on an equal footing and from that you see some of the problems in terms of how she tries to solve not only the national question but also the question precisely around the uh, around the peasant question where in Hungary in 1918-1919 the ultra leftist Bela Kuhn effectively you know expropriates all not only big landlords but also the small petty you know peasants who are you know plowing on their little plot of land and effectively Lenin takes exactly a different approach to the question because he's dealing in diff very different objective circumstances of where he wants to win leadership 
and the working class winning leadership over those peasants. And Rosa Luxemburg, again, uh, uh, sides uh, uh, again there. She sides against against Lenin. However, what is what is really crucial is is that she doesn't simply she doesn't simply say that you know Leninism should be should be written off because sim she had very big respect for Lenin. And what she says is, in this sense, there's. Uh, theirs is the immortal historical service of having marched at the head of the international proletariat with the conquest of political power and the practical placing of the problems of the realization of socialism and have, of having advanced mightily the settlement of the score between capital and labor in the entire world. And in this sense, the future everywhere belongs to Bolshevism. And for, some, for many people whom we come across saying that Rosa Luxemburg is very different you know, to Lenin, is very different to Trotsky, effectively all I would use is that quote to say, <laughs> he says the future of Bolshevism, uh, Bolshe uh, the future belongs to Bolshevism, is actually more than, uh, than true. But, but what she combines is, is the belief in worldwide revolution and socialist revolutions with what with Marx's maxim of a ruthless criticism of everything existing, and that really shines throughout her entire in her, her entire work. Whether you read the kind of uh, accumulation of cap her work on the accumulation of capital, where she tr where she tries where she polemicizes against people like Hilferding and and other theorists inside of the SPD, whether it's her writings on in reform and revolution, where she advances a critique of Bernstein, or even in the kind of works that where she polemicizes again against Lenin. And what I think we can take away from Rosa Luxemburg more, th more than ever is effectively coming to terms with the kind of debates that are happening around organization and spontaneity. Because even though she, as Mark points out and, and I pointed out, even though she overemphasizes the capability of spontaneous struggles breaking through the kind of bureaucratic structures of the SPD and of organization. Nevertheless, her main emphasis relies on the self-activity of the working class. And that is a crucial point for us as revolutionary socialists, that ultimately the agent of change isn't like Kautsky says, the parliamentarians sitting in you know, the par parliament chamber voting on whether they support the war or not. It doesn't lie you know, in the self-activity of the ultra-leftists you know, blowing up railway bridges, but it effectively lies in the capacity of the working class to act, to act in its own collective self-interest. Self and the working class, unfortunately, is only as strong as its leaders are. It is only as strong as the organizations that grow out of the kind of actions. And unfortunately, what we saw in Germany was, is that the will of the working class to take, to see state power, to take state power was ultimately there. What lacked was the kind of leadership that could provide, uh, that could provide <laughs> the kind of direction, that could provide the kind of impetus in order to conduct a successful revolution. And to, to borrow a phrase from Trotsky, the relationship of party and class is one of the steam and the piston. Because we saw how, you know, in Kiel, you know, so, so sailors mutiny. We saw how in the rural area workers you know, workers took on you know, the French occupy French occupy pine armies. What we didn't see was how the Communist Party was able to coordinate between those different struggles and actually provide the kind of piston that could have successfully not only smashed uh, not only smashed the German capitalist state, but created a sense of worldwide revolution. Because the defeat of the working class revolution in Germany didn't only hail the end of the working class revolution in Germany, but throughout the entire world. And it meant that years, the years that followed in Russia, meant starvation and the Stalinization of, of the revolution inside of Russia, and meant ultimately also the kernels of defeat of the German working class through fascism were laid in the defeat of, of the revolution itself. And so let's make sure that next time around it, we won't get defeated.